Amen. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to start here. Um, I want us to look very quickly. This is what we left off on. I appreciate Brother John Uter uh, preaching last Wednesday. Outstanding message. Outstanding service. Boy, I needed it. It was good. And I appreciate that. Today is 9-11. Today, uh, so what was it, 18 years ago today, I got a phone call at night. That was 18 years. Got a phone call. We was all watching the news, watching those buildings. And knowing that there was something bad had just happened. And I got a phone call from Christina over here. And she said, Brother Mike, she said, Uncle Mike. She said, I'm scared. Is this the end of the world? And I said, no, it's not. And, so, and, I, and it was like on a Tuesday. And I said, tomorrow night I'm going to preach on this. And she said, well, I'm scared. I'm scared to death. I said, you ought to be scared. You ought to be scared because you're going to die and go to hell. And she said, I don't want that. And I said, well, tomorrow night, I'm going to preach on what all this is from what I can see from the Bible. And tomorrow night, you can have the opportunity to give your life to Jesus. She said, I'm not waiting till tomorrow night. She got on her knees that night and asked Jesus into her heart to save her. Okay, 18 years ago. That's not been, she's not been perfect all those years. But she's sitting in a room full of people just like her. Amen. And, uh, but that's what the word of God does to people. Okay. God, God will use things like 9-11 to shake us. To wake us up a little bit. Amen. And that's what happened. Anyway, uh, when we were comparing, uh, a couple weeks ago, we were comparing Jesus with the Bible. And I wanted to finish with this one. Re both of them will judge us. Romans chapter 2 verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. There's another verse that says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Christ is our judge. And somebody say amen. Okay. Now there's, and you've heard me say this before. There's people who don't like preaching, especially when you're preaching on their sins. And they say, well, you're judging me. Nobody has a right to judge me except God. And I said, you know what? You're exactly right. But I'm going to tell you something. You, you're not going to like it. You're not going to like what God's got to say to you. Because when God judges you, he's not going to just pull things out of thin air that he doesn't like about you. He's going to judge you according to John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And he means it. God's going to take everything that you've done. It's been written down by an angel. So I want you, to, every day that you wake up and go through your, go through your stuff, I want you to remember that you've got an angel with a clipboard. Walking behind you going, uh-oh. <sighs> Writing everything you've done down. Every thought, every word, every deed, all your covetousness, all your lust, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. He's writing all that down. And it's not forgotten. God doesn't just... After 20 years, there's no statute of limitations on your sin. The very first sin that you ever committed in your life is still written down there waiting for you to show up to be judged by that. They're going to pull things out. Listen, the, and the government's getting to the point now to where they've got stuff on you that you would not believe that they have on you. The NSA, somebody from the NSA could call you tonight and say, okay, now when you were five, we noticed that you did this and you did this at somebody else's house. How in the world did you know that? We're the government. It's our job to know that. Well, there's an angel that's wrote everything down. And it doesn't just go away. God's going to judge you according to the words that are in this book. So why do you think then that the devil works tirelessly to constantly change and alter the words that are in the book that God's going to judge everybody from? 
all of a sudden now, in the Bible, it doesn't have the word sodomite in it anymore. They took that out. So I don't guess God can judge sodomites now because that's not in the Bible anymore. So that's what somebody sent me. It was um, Steve and Jenny who, who come to visit here every now and then. They, they said that they saw where a preacher wrote, I would rather see two men who are holding each other's hands than two men with guns in their hands. That's wicked. That is wicked. That man is going to be judged not by me, not by you, not by anybody else. He's going to be judged by this book. Amen. He's going to be judged by that book. Now turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We're identifying who Christ is. Christ is the man. He is the man. If you remember Adam, Adam is a type of... Of Jesus Christ. And that's what you see in Romans chapter 5. You have the first man and the second man. The first Adam, the second Adam. The first Adam was called in Luke chapter 3. He was called the son of God. It's what he was called in the lineage. They gave the lineage starting from Jesus going backwards all the way down. There's 77 names in that list. Can you believe that? 77 names in the list. In Luke chapter 3, from Jesus down to God, 77. That sounds like perfection to me. Amen? And in the list in Matthew, there's 42 names. That's 7 times 6. Again, a multiple of 7 in both of those lineages. I'd say Jesus is the perfect man. Somebody say amen. He's perfect in every way. So the first, where the first Adam failed... The second Adam succeeded. So you look at this. It's, he's the one. We have the one man that failed. Now we have the one man that succeeded. Romans 5 verse 15. But not as the offense. So also is the free gift. So in the Garden of Eden. Remember I was teaching about this. And in, in what was it? Uh, Sunday night. I was teaching about this. There was one law. Therefore there was one sin. One offense. So here's, here's God now. Here's the brilliance of God. God says, okay, there's one law. That means there can only be one sin. Man commits one sin. But by God's grace, God then has one gift. One gift. And that gift is everything. Everything. It's the whole universe. It's the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's, it's eternity. It's eternal life. There isn't anything left out of the one gift of God. And that one gift is represented by that one man, Jesus Christ, who had to die how many times? Or as some of y'all say, once. Or twice. <laughs> Alright. For if through the offense of many. Verse 15. For if through the offense of one. Many be dead. Much more the grace of God. And the gift by grace. Which is by one man. Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. This is in diametric opposition. Opposition to the Roman Catholic doctrine. That Mary is the co-savior along with Jesus Christ. That's a lie. It's a lie out of hell. Amen. It is by, he didn't say by one man and, and his mother. He said it's by one man. Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. Verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So, we went from having one law that could be broken, one sin that could be committed, then Moses comes along, and now we've got all kinds of things that we can't do. Well, we can't commit adultery, we can't covet, we can't, we can't uh, uh, say nasty words, we can't lie. I mean, it's like, man, we can't do anything that's fun. 
God made the offenses big to show you that His grace is bigger than all your sins. Somebody say amen. Listen, I don't know what's got you mad today, but I didn't feel good all day today now. Now I'm feeling awesome. You know why? This book. If by one man's offense, death, look at verse 17. Maybe I didn't read all of verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so was the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Where did I lose? I lost my place. For verse 17, for by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. You sinned a lot, didn't you? You sinned an abundance of sins. And yet, the condemnation has been lifted off of you by one man. Jesus Christ. So, verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by, look at verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So, by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. I, I don't know about you, but Romans 5 is one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. If I could do a cartwheel right now, I would. Because it, I get it. I get this. You have one man who now has passed on sin through his loins through his DNA to every one of us. And every one of us has broken so many of God's commandments. There is no way in the world we will ever pay off our sin of our debt of sin. Never will be able to pay that off. So it's by by, by one man's disobedience. So I've told this story, I don't know how many times. Old Testament. Here's the serpent with cancer in his mouth. The words that he speaks, they're full of cancer. The serpent comes to Eve. It tells her about that commandment that God made. God didn't really say that. And, and by the way, he didn't really mean it. And by the way, God's trying to hide something from you. I've got a better way for you. Why don't you go ahead and eat it and you'll be like one of us gods. She fell for it. Adam fell for it. Then you have the New Testament. Jesus shows up. And he's in the wilderness 40 days, starving to death. I'm sure that when the devil said, turn these stones into bread, I'm sure Jesus is going, boy, that'd be good. I haven't eaten in 40 days. But where Adam failed, listen to me, you're Adam. Where you failed, one man succeeded. And that's all it took, was one man. That's all it took, one man. I'll give you an example. How many prophets of Baal were there that were supposed to call down the fire from Baal to burn the sacrifice. How many prophets of Baal were there? They were all cutting themselves and crying and everything. Do you remember that? How many were there? Huh? Something like 400. 400 men crying to Baal, cutting themselves, making a big deal about it. Baal never showed up. How many was on the Lord's side? How many times did he pray? One time. One man prayed one time. Now you listen to me. I don't mind praying for y'all. And you folks online, 
I don't mind praying for you. I love it when you pray for me. But I've heard that social media has made this, and I, it stinks. I hate it. If you, if you love Jesus, then you have to pass this on to 50 people to show you love Jesus. No, you don't. That's stupid. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And the Bible then says about Elijah that he was a man of like passions as you and I. Yet, he prayed one time and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed one time and it rained after three and a half years. And you have one man who said, God, send fire down from heaven. And God sent fire down from heaven. It only takes one prayer. It only takes one prayer. Now, I believe in fasting. I believe in wrestling with God. I believe in all of those things. But God heard the first prayer that you prayed. The first one. And he never forgot it. And the first tear you ever shed, you know what God did with it? He put it in a bottle and saved it. That's what the Bible says. He stored up all of your tears in a bottle. Okay? And I, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, it's by one man. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You cannot out-sin God's grace. You also cannot out sin God's rod. Amen. Amen. When he decides you're done, you're done. He's going to whoop you until you stop. He's not going to let go. Verse, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. See, it only took one man. It only took one man. Now, turn your Bible to, oh, let's see here. What do I want to do? What do I want to do? What do I want to do? Let's do this. Turn to uh, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. So we're identifying Christ. Christ is the Savior. Christ is the Savior. Luke chapter 2. Look at verse, um, look at verse seven, Luke chapter two. This is the, um, this is the what what we call the Christmas story. This is where Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Verse uh, six, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country. Shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to who? All people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior. That's how he's identified in the scriptures. He is identified first as the Savior. And notice this. The angels did not go to Herod. The angels did not go to Caesar, Augustus. The angels did not uh, congregate the, the Senate of Rome. He did not go to all the kings and the wise men of the earth and said, we've brought the Savior to the world. You're the most important people here. So we're going to put him in your hands. Those people don't get saved. 
the angels went out to the workers, to the, guy, to the guys that didn't go to high school, that didn't take algebra, the guys that didn't know how to spell their name, the guys that worked for a living, the guys who were out sleeping outside at night because they had a job to do. He went to those who were poor and of a low estate. That's who the angels went to first. Went the, to the poor people because it's the poor people who need the gospel, not the rich. The rich people, for the most part, will never get saved because they do not need a savior. They have money to get them out of all of their problems. Jeffrey Epstein, I guarantee you that man was murdered. Guarantee you that man was murdered. He thought that his money and, and the connections that he had with the rich and the powerful people would be able to get him out of the trouble that he was in, but he became a liability because he knew the names of people like Bill Clinton and others who, were, who went to Pedophile Island and Prince Andrew went to Pedophile Island slept with underage girls, Jeffrey Epstein thought his money and his political connections would get him out of his sins. And it didn't work. They killed him because he is a liability. I believe that with all my heart. And I, I believe partly, I believe JFK, I believe Marilyn Monroe was slaughtered because she, she was sleeping with both Robert and John F. Kennedy both. She thought her money and her political connections, she sold herself for a million dollars to Hugh Hefner. Million dollars. To pull her clothes off for Hugh Hefner's playboy. She thought her money and her political connections would get her out of trouble. And they slaughtered her for that. I guarantee you that's how that happened. No, I wasn't there, but I'm just telling you. The wealthy of this world think that their wealth and their connections can get them out of anything. That's like Brother John last week. He was preaching about, can't remember the story, but he said something about, to a doctor, he said something about God did this, and that doctor went, huh. He didn't get excited. He didn't believe in God. He's got money. He's a doctor. He's a scientist. He don't believe in God. The angels went to the poor people. They went to the sinners. They went to the truck drivers. They went to the guys working out in the fields. They went to those guys to give them who? The Savior. Before Jesus is anything, He's the Savior because man needs to be saved. Amen. So, uh, the angel said, Fear not, verse 10, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you who is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, Jesus is. Now, I want you, I want you to look at your... Uh, I want all you Jehovah's Witness people to look at your Bible. If Jesus is declared to be the Savior... I used to play these games with Brady Crumb. Back when Brady was a Jehovah's Witness, he would call me every now and then thinking he could outsmart me. And I would ha I'd be ready for him. I think I could outsmart him. Did you know that they absolutely destroyed the New World Translation of the Bible so bad? I, I never won an argument with him. Because I would give him a verse out of the King James that I thought would just absolutely kill the idea that Jesus wasn't God. And Brady would pull up the New World Translation and says, no, nope, right here. And he'd read it off and I'm going, oh man, they got that one too. Okay, I, I won't get into that, but I'm, listen to me, all you Jehovah's Witness and anybody else, you listen to this. The Old Testament declared who the Savior was. The Savior was the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That means Jehovah, the Lord. Is the Savior. Psalm 106, 21. They forgot God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. 
Now you think about that. There are people who used to sit in this church who don't sit in this church anymore. Now, some go to other churches, okay. Some, I've been here a long time. I've seen some just roll up and quit. Not everybody that left Egypt made it to the promised land. You know why? They forgot their Savior. They forgot their Savior. You say, Pastor, are you saying they lost their salvation? I'm saying, it doesn't look like they ever had it. They, let, they saw God's miracles in Egypt. They sent 12 spies into Canaan land. They come back, 10 of them said, we can't go in there. They said, okay, that's good enough for us. Let's go back to Egypt. They forgot God, their Savior. God is the one who slaughtered the Egyptians' chariots in the Red Sea. God is the one who did that, and they forgot that. Now listen to me. If I hit you pretty hard about coming to church, why am I doing that? Why am I trying to nail you about how you're not coming to church like you used to? Why am I doing that? Why would I do that? Is it because I think it looks good to have full pews? You guys, I know me better than that. What I know is when you start backsliding, it's church attendance is not the first thing that leaves. Bible reading and prayer is. And when your church attendance fails, I know already you ain't read your Bible in a long time. You ain't prayed in a long time. Church attendance is not the first sign that you're backsliding. By the time you start not showing up, you're well on your way. Amen? They forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. So God said, you guys are going to walk a circle for 40 years until every one of you dies right here in the wilderness. There ain't a one of you that's going to go enter into the promised land except Joshua and Caleb and the, two, and, and the babes. Did I teach that the other night about the babes who didn't know the difference between good and evil? Did I teach that? Okay. That's how we know babies go to heaven. That's how we know babies go to heaven. Because they have not learned to put difference between good and evil. They don't know the difference. And one of the signs of it is they run around naked. They run around naked. Little children run around naked. That's nothing to them. Automatically, shame shows up at some point in their life, doesn't it? Doesn't it? How many you moms know this about your children? At some point, Isaac quit running around the house naked. Was it yesterday, Isaac? Last week? It's been a while, hadn't it? That means at, at about that point, he's starting to understand the shame of his nakedness, which means he's starting to understand good and evil. That's the first thing that happened to Adam and Eve. They knew they needed a covering. They knew they needed a Savior. Isaiah 43, 3, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. So, look at this. Who's, who's their Savior? Number one, the Lord their God, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's Jehovah, thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopian Seba, for thee. The Lord God is Jesus Christ who is their Savior. Isaiah 43, 11, I, even I, am the, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, and beside me there is no Savior. Again, this destroys 
the Catholic doctrine of Mary being what they're now calling co-redemptrix. You know what that means? That she is equally as important in redeeming mankind as Jesus is on the cross. Catholic doctrine teaches that when Christ was on the cross suffering, Mary was at the foot of the cross suffering equally with Jesus. She felt all the nails. She felt all the pain. She felt the spear. She felt all of the sins laid upon her. Catholic doctrine teaches this, that Mary is the co-savior with Jesus. And without Mary, there can be no salvation. Makes me want to kick their teeth down their throat over that. That's from hell. Amen? That doctrine is from hell. Beside me, God says, there is no Savior. None. Isaiah 45, 15. Verily, thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. The Savior. And he's the God who is the Savior. So is Jesus God? Absolutely. Because the only one who can be the Savior must be God. And if Jesus isn't God, then he cannot be the Savior fulfilling the Scriptures. Cannot be. Isaiah 45, 21. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. We have another witness in the Bible. That declares that there is no other Savior along with Jesus Christ. Not Mary, not James, not Peter, not John, not Matthew, not none of the prophets, not Saint M Mother Teresa, Saint this, Saint that. They are not saviors. There can be no other savior than God. Can be no other savior. Isaiah 60. Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles and shalt suck the breast of kings. Thou shalt... You know what I think that means? I think it means they're going to read the King James Bible. The King James Bible is a Gentile Bible. It is a Gentile translation of the Scriptures. Thou shalt suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shalt suck the breast of kings, and thou shalt know that I... Now, that's just my guess. That's a clue. That's a little theory that I have. Don't come out and make a video on me saying, Mike Hoggard the heretic. There's like 20 of those videos. Get in line. Anyway, that thou shalt know that I... I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. I, the Lord, ca again, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's Jehovah. That is God's name, the Lord. He and He alone is the Savior. Isaiah 63, 8. For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior. Capital S. Hosea 13, 4. Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me. For there is no Savior beside me. So again, let's... Let's get mean about cultish doctrines. The Catholic Church establishes Mary, the Pope, the priests, the confessional, the saints, and the church as saviors along with Jesus. 
that you must do what the church tells you to do in order, in order to be saved or you cannot be saved. So what they're doing is they're putting themselves on equal ground with God, the Savior. They're saying we also are the Savior. Seventh-day Adventists, and I'm saying this because this is being preached in Kenya. And in Kenya, and where our radio stations are, we are surrounded by Roman Catholics and Seventh-day Adventists, and they hate my guts. Now, I don't hate these fellas. I love them. And I want you to know that I want, to, I want God to set you free. I'd look for a Roman Catholic priest to listen to that radio and get saved. Now, Seventh-day Adventists to be listening to Eka Yokan Radio in Turkana, Lodwar Turkana, and get saved. By the way, the power mysteriously shut down our radio station the other day in Lodwar. Just mysteriously did that. Anyway, Seventh-day Adventists add law-keeping of going to church on the Sabbath as part of your salvation. They're saying that the fourth commandment and your keeping of the fourth commandment is necessary for your salvation. So there is the Lord, the Savior, and Sabbath keeping now is your salvation. And I don't care what else they put into it, whether it's Sabbath keeping or praying into idols or whether it's um, fundamentalist doctrine where guys all have to have their hair cut real short and tight and women all have to wear dresses all the time and must have long hair. And what happens is people make rules part of salvation. I've been a fundamentalist all my life. I put the mental in fundamental. Okay. I also put the fun in fundamental. But I've been a fundamentalist all my life. And I have seen legalism. In every form possible. To where if you don't look a certain look. You're not saved. If you don't have a certain way that you live. You're not saved. They've added rules to salvation. And there is no other savior. The length of your hair does not save you. The length of your dress does not save you. Your earrings or lack of your earrings do not save you. None of these things save you. It is about you are saved by the mercy and grace of God alone. Now, I preach against tattoos. God said don't do it. But I would love for somebody who is just covering tattoos. Get saved and start coming to church here. Love for it to happen. Okay? Because you're not saved. And I've had people ask me, Pastor, I've got, tat I've got tattoos. Am I going to hell? No. Your flesh is going to rot and corrupt. In a thousand years, there'll be no tattoo. There'll be no tattoo on you. You're going to be in heaven and there are no tattoos in heaven. Amen. Oh, let's see here. John 4, 42. And he said unto the woman, now we believe not because of thy sing, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed Christ. The savior of the world. He's the savior. Not just of the Jews. He's the Savior of the whole world. Every Gentile race, every Gentile color, every Gentile nation, and Jews. The whole world. He is the Savior of every one of them. Amen. Acts 5.31, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Now that's, watch this now, that's what a savior does. When liberals start trying to tell you about what the Bible says, about how this, you're not supposed to judge this and Jesus would, Jesus would do it this way, remind them that Jesus came to do one thing, to give repentance and forgiveness of sins. 
If there is no repentance and forgiveness of sins, there is no salvation. And I'm going to have a video made on me for that statement. I've had several of them. By a group that follows a guy down somewhere. I'm not even going to name his name. I'm not going to give him any credit. But he teaches that if you teach repentance as part of salvation, you're preaching a work salvation and you're a heretic. And I'm going to give you a verse. Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation not to be repented of. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto us Israel, a Savior, Jesus. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. For, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking for the Savior to come. And I'm ready for him. Amen? I'm ready for him. I'm telling you, some things are going to happen in this world. It's going to blow your mind. Soon. Soon. Some stuff's going to break out. Soon. I don't know how soon. I'm not a date setter. God took me out a long time ago. I'm telling you. Get your heart in this book. Keep it there. Don't pull back. Amen.